After a nearly two-year delay, the Ford report has been released. Headed by QC Martin Ford, the review was tasked with investigating another report written under Corbyn's leadership that detailed subversion by Labour Party staff, or alleged subversion, I should say. It was widely known as the Labour leaks, which we we covered um, well on this show. Now, the remit of Ford's review included the circumstances in which the Labour leaks report was written and the circumstances of it being leaked, as well as the many claims it made. And perhaps surprisingly, as this report was commissioned under Keir Starmer, Ford vindicates much of what that original leaked report stated. For example, you might remember that some of the most explosive parts of the Labour leaks report involved WhatsApp groups messages from senior anti-Corbyn staff in HQ. They included comments by party managers that Diane Abbott literally made them sick, that she was truly repulsive and a very angry woman and comments about Carrie Murphy, Corbyn's chief of staff, that she was a, quote, crazy woman and a, quote, big-faced cow. Of the leaked WhatsApp exchanges, the Ford report says, It has been put to us by a number of witnesses. The extracts of the messages quoted in the leaked report were cherry-picked and selectively edited, such that the quotes that appear in the leaked report are both unrepresentative and misleading. Having reviewed the transcripts and considered evidence from many of those involved, we do not agree. We find that the messages on the SMT, so senior management team WhatsApp, reveal deplorably factional and insensitive and at times discriminatory attitudes expressed by many of the party's most senior staff. The report also said the criticisms of Diane Abbott are not simply a harsh response to perceived poor performance. They are expressions of visceral disgust, drawing on racist tropes, and they bear little resemblance to the criticisms of white male MPs elsewhere in the messages. All incredibly damning there. In another passage of the report, it says, We have taken into account that many of the comments were made in jest and were not intended seriously or literally, contrary on occasion to the leaked report's framing of them. That does not, in our view, negate all criticism of them. It is, or should be, self-evident that saying that you hope someone has been run over by a train or that someone deserves to die in a fire is reprehensible, even if you were joking. For party staff to consider such jokes acceptable in relation to colleagues or party members suggests to us that they had become detached from both professional and personal norms. We're going to go through multiple um, key parts of the Ford report. That was just um, the parts that concerned offensive and discriminatory attitudes among senior staff. Before we go on to those other parts, I want to bring in my colleague, Aaron Bastani, and for his thoughts on the Ford report. You know, as those um, quotes I've just read out suggest, it's quite punchy, isn't it? It doesn't read as a whitewash. No, it's certainly not a whitewash, Michael. Um, it, it's very, in, in parts, I think that that for me was a real knockout. The one you said, for instance, about the senior management team, that was a real set of knockout sentences. I thought that was the the paragraph for me that really just cut through the media bullshit and was very clear. It is, however, a legal document. I mean, in particular, the recommendations are quite anodyne. But what do you expect? You know, you're not going to have a QC start declaring that people of a bottom that they're cancelled and that it's disgraceful and they should be ostracised. That's the language of the wingnut Labour right and of the media. It's not the language, generally speaking, of, of lawyers and, and legal inquiries led by QCs. So there is some ambiguity. Obviously, I think you've had to please and appease multiple stakeholders. I'm sure that there have been multiple edits. But you're absolutely right. On four or five hugely important topics, all of which have been really mocked by the media, the verdict is absolutely clear. And I guess we'll go over this uh, you know, over the next 5, 10, 15 minutes. But any one of those paragraphs, including that one you've just read there, Michael, about the senior management team and how the leaked WhatsApp messages, which we first reported on Navarro Media, was actually representative of a toxic and, quote, discriminatory culture at the top of the organization. If I had said that on the BBC or Sky News, uh, I would have been mocked and laughed at and jeered, not just by the other guests, but often the host too. And so what I think is super interesting here is, like you say, the often punchy, not always, often punchy language that comes through here and how much at odds it is with the lazy, pedestrian, low information analysis we often expect from mainstream media. Let's talk next about anti-Semitism, one of the key topics of the Ford report and, of course, you know, how it was handled. As you'll remember, during Corbyn's leadership, the Labour right claimed that he was responsible for an outbreak of rampant anti-Semitism in the party and that he was also responsible for it going unpunished. In contrast, the Labour leaks report said that while anti-Semitism was a problem, 
Many of the troubles the party had in addressing it were down to subversion from the party's right. Now, the Ford report was tasked with adjudicating these competing claims, and it seems to really have decided to both sides the issue. So the Ford report reads, The evidence clearly demonstrated that a vociferous faction in the party sees any issues regarding anti-Semitism as exaggerated by the right to embarrass the left. It was, of course, also true that some opponents of Jeremy Corbyn saw the issue of anti-Semitism as a means of attacking him. Thus, rather than confront the paramount need to deal with the profoundly serious issue of anti-Semitism in the party, both factions treated it as a factional weapon. So as I say, but, you know, everyone had a little bit to blame. It's not particularly ex explanatory um, in that sense, to my mind at least. Ford's judgment with respect to media reporting on the row, though, was more unequivocal. So we'll go to the Ford report's verdict in one moment. First, let's just remind you of the most impactful coverage of Labour and anti-Semitism during Corbyn's tenure. It was a BBC Panorama documentary hosted by John Ware. Corbyn and his office have repeatedly said that when party members are accused of anti-Semitism, they don't interfere in the disciplinary process. Indeed, the Labour Party said any such suggestion is categorically untrue. But that doesn't seem to be the case. In an email, Mr Corbyn's Director of Communications, Seamus Milne, asked for a review of the disciplinary process into anti-Semitic complaints. There was a risk, he said, of muddling up political disputes with racism. The Labour Party told us this was not a request for any kind of formal review. How did you interpret that email from Mr Milne? The, the same way that all staff in Labour's head office did, which is that this was the leader's office requesting to be uh, involved directly in the disciplinary process. This is not a helpful suggestion, it is an instruction. But it's framed as a suggestion. Yes, it's all framed as a suggestion. But this is not some junior staff at the leader's office. This is Seamus Milne, director of communications, part of Jeremy Corbyn's inner circle. He is probably one of, if not the most influential person within the leader's office. And in that context, when he says, I think we need to review this process going forward, that isn't a suggestion. That's him instructing what he expects to happen without needing to say it. The leader's office did not intervene. These former disaffected employees sought the view of staff in the leader's office, which was complied with in good faith. These disaffected former officials include those who have always opposed Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, worked to actively undermine it, and have both personal and political axes to grind. The claims in that documentary that Corbyn allies interfered in disciplinary processes and the implication was to let people off, they were incredibly damaging. And I remember the period well. Criticising the documentary was almost impossible in the mainstream media. The moment you did it, and we all did it at Navarra, you were dismissed as a conspiracy theorist and an apologist for anti-Semitism. Let's look at what the Ford report had to say on that topic and on the media coverage of this issue. During spring 2018, the period on which much of the reporting has focused, Lottos, that's leader of the opposition staff, provided input into specific cases after it was sought, sometimes insistently by HQ staff, who refused to proceed until they had it. HQ staff say that they were forced into making those requests by persistent offline interference by Lotto, which they wanted to bring into the open. Whatever HQ's motives, however, we find that Lotto staff responded to the requests for the most part reasonably and in good faith. We note that their responses were subsequently used to form the basis of wholly misleading media reports, which suggested that Lotto staff had aggressively imposed themselves on the process against HQ's wishes. Aaron, what's your take on how the Ford review or the Ford report has, has addressed the anti-Semitism row? Well, on the specifics of the, um, the John Ware Panorama documentary, Michael, I mean, this is utterly extraordinary. This is a stake through the heart of the reputation of John Ware and of also the BBC, I believe. Many of us, many of the people watching this, grew up with a great deal of respect for the BBC, but particularly for its investigative journalism. At the time, of course, ITV also did that very well, the Cook Report and so on. But Panorama was really something of a gold standard when it came to investigative journalism, original news gathering, 
breaking hugely important stories. What we've got with John Ware and Panorama and this hit job fundamentally on the Labour Party was nothing more than an intentionally, I believe, misrepresentative story of the facts. And it took a QC uh, and it took this two year uh, process, highly legal, highly formal, out of the glare of the public eye to make that clear. Now, to return back again to this appalling Panorama documentary, which I think really does undermine Panorama's reputation from here on in, I will never trust it ever again. It was nominated for a BAFTA, Michael, this documentary. This, this mercilessly unfair, unscrupulous piece of half-truths, which clearly started with an agenda, I believe. I think that's quite obvious to anybody watching the people being interviewed and how they're treated, the leading questions by John Ware. This was nominated for a BAFTA. Multiple criticisms were made. Complaints were submitted. Of course, you can submit complaints to the BBC. All of them rejected. Complaints made to Ofcom, the broadcast regulator. All of them rejected. I really do think this is an extraordinary example of political groupthink, uh, not just in the media class, but in the political class too, and how this really overlapped for a really long period of time. And like you say, we published two articles that really stick out in my mind, which were very strong criticisms of this documentary and of the people it was interviewing and saying it wasn't particularly fair, it was highly partial, it really didn't live up to the highest journalistic standards you would expect of the BBC. We published two pieces on that. Just for publishing them, people were trying to cancel us. People were saying that we were the bottom. How could you share something by Navarra Media? They're problematic. Why? <laughs> they questioned the John Ware Panorama documentary. Hello, when did this become a thing? That, sorry, it's now verboten, it's now unacceptable to, to question a panorama documentary. So to return to your question about anti-Semitism, Labour and the anti-Semitism issue, crisis, however you want to sort of construct the words, this was never going to be addressed. It couldn't be addressed. Many people driving this in order to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. I'm not saying there was no anti-Semitism. There was. I've written about this many, many times, but it was also instrumentally used by a number of people. A number of people never wanted it to be sold for quite clear reasons, because they viewed it explicitly as an Achilles heel that could undermine and undo the Labour leadership. And that's people tweeting about it online, Labour organisers, people are, uh, who are quite active in local CRPs and whatnot. And I think it's a tragedy that what should have been a, a really important collective moment for education and learning around anti-Semitism, which is often a, a form of racism which can be insidious, half understood, people might perpetrate it without even realizing. I think what could have been a really awesome um, collective learning experience was wasted because some very malicious, malevolent people, many of whom are active in the media, didn't want that. They wanted to misrepresent and defame a political leader because they didn't agree with a number of his policies. We should probably say, because he is quite litigious, I have every confidence John Ware would vociferously deny um, that he made that documentary of any bad intentions or of any agenda and that it was you know, purely um, all from an objective journalistic standpoint. Although, of course, um, I wholly agree with you, Aaron, about the output. Um, I think it was a pretty shoddy piece of journalism. On the topic of journalism, let's discuss how the media have covered the Ford report itself. So The Guardian focused on the both sides narrative in the report. Their headline reads, anti-Semitism issue used as factional weapon in Labour report finds. And they've said a report commissioned by Keir Starmer highlights toxicity on both sides under Jeremy Corbyn. Others seem to go straight to comments from the Labour leadership instead of reading the document itself. This was Paul War's first comment on the report. He's the chief political commentator at the I newspaper. So he said, new from Labour, the Ford report completely debunks the conspiracy theory that the 2017 general election was somehow deliberately sabotaged by Labour Party staff opposed to Corbyn's leadership. The report, in fact, confirmed that right-wing staff diverted over 100 grand of funds away from winnable seats. I suppose what's being drawn upon there is that the report said, oh, that wasn't necessarily them intentionally um, trying to throw the election. So it seems like a slanted takeaway to me. And slanted takeaways were very much forthcoming from the Labour leadership. A spokesperson said, the Ford report details a party that was out of control. Keir Starmer is now in control and has made real progress in ridding the party of the destructive factionalism and unacceptable culture that did so much damage previously and contributed to our defeat in 2019. Unsurprisingly, no one in the mainstream media has picked up on the fact that Starmer has only rid the party of factionalism in the sense 
that he has brutally, completely purged one faction. <laughs> so it wasn't like, oh, let's move beyond factionalism. So let's get rid of factionalism by completely expelling the left on completely spurious grounds. It's not anything Corbyn would have got away with. For Keir Starmer, that's completely fine. No one is going to say a thing. Now, Aaron, I think all of this journalism uh, on this report is pretty lazy. At the same time, I do think the, the flaw of the report is that it kind of left that option open for both the Labour leadership and the media because a lot of it is sort of saying, oh, this was just two sides who couldn't see beyond their political disagreements. And it kind of ignores the fact that one had a democratic mandate, one was trying to bring back a democratic elected leader, and one was trying to firefight because it was being brought down from every direction. Yeah, it's nonsense, Michael. I mean, clearly, it's a legal report looking into a political party. In a political party, a leader is given a mandate to do certain things, you know, and if they're not allowed to execute the mandate they're given by the membership, whether that be for internal change, change in political direction, change in policy, change in personnel, if HQ, other MPs, if they're trying to sabotage that, that leader has a mandate to do something about them. So I, I agree with you. The both sides doesn't work. I do think it's accurate to say that ultimately, by 2018, there was a, it was completely impossible to address the situation, and that that was true. That is absolutely true. Where I would depart from the report is it was it was impossible for it to be anything but that. We have to remember we've had two years now of Ian McNichol and these losers, frankly. Uh, who, by the way, Ian McNichol? Wow, who comes out of the Ford report any worse than Ian McNichol? It's hard to think of any, any, anybody, frankly. Who's, they, they've tried to rehabilitate him in recent years. The former general secretary. He was canvassing with David Evans last year in the local elections. By the way, he was meeting the Israeli Labour Party, seemingly on official business for the UK Labour Party uh, just a few months ago. He doesn't, you know, media requests them sometimes. I sometimes see him popping up on on Sky News. So these people come out of it very, very poorly, and. I think that fundamentally, Jeremy Corbyn should have been more ruthless and harsher with them. That doesn't mean he's as bad as them. It means he's acting on a democratic mandate from the membership. But look, this is a legal report. It's very loyally, and in terms of its, you know, in terms of how it understands due process, it's going to treat this more as a kind of set of bureaucratic problems. And of course, politics always supersedes bureaucracy. That's the point. It's a political party. You're meant to be acting on the political wishes of the membership. If that's being obstructed. You should be able to treat people in a certain way, which basically says, get your ass out of the door. So, yes, I think it's weak on that. But on on the really, really big stories, which, like you say, have been shamelessly sidestepped by much of the media, um, I, I think it is really, really good. You know, let's look at what it's talking about here. Misallocation of funds, sending funds to constituencies which the leader's office wasn't aware of, a culture of anti-black racism, obstruction of promotion of people from minorities, the senior management team being really nasty and quote unquote in engaging in discriminatory attitudes. Uh, the fact that the senior, I mean, my God, Michael, the senior leadership of the Labour Party in 2015 and 2016 intentionally tried to undermine the internal democratic processes of the Labour Party. And what we've had on the left and what we've had on Navarro Media for the last seven years, effectively, is people saying that you're ridiculous, you're talking nonsense, this is a conspiracy theory. And they tried to do that again yesterday. Paul War, Rachel Kearmouth, Pippa Crera. But unfortunately, it couldn't work because there is this 138-page document that anybody can read, and they can see that they're talking out of their backsides. So, you know, strangely, we often think of these kinds of documents as as not helpful for the left. You know, the left say we win political battles on, you know, a political line rather than appealing to bureaucratic procedure. Often true. That's not the case with the Ford report. I think it's a really, really useful document. Finally, I find it utterly perplexing that the NEC saw this the first time after two years yesterday. They didn't have time to read it. So you have an all-day NEC meeting talking about the Ford report. They've not read the Ford report. They're only reading the recommendations. And by the way, David Evans' time as General Secretary of the Labour Party, how he's behaved and the organisational change he's overseen is completely at odds with the recommendations. One of the recommendations is you need to detach the sort of functions of the leader's office from Party HQ. These should be separate sort of bureaucracies administered separately, insulated from one another. Well, David Evans has been firing people from Labour HQ and duplicating the roles within the leader's office because then they can hire people who are more politically favourable. And they can get rid of people who they view as too left wing, which is, of course, you know, 90 percent of Labour members and activists right now. So 
the recommendations aren't productive for them either. I know I said I'd finish on that, but there was one more thing which did make me laugh, Michael, was the criticism of the Jewish labor movement um, trainings. You know, they said these trainings aren't particularly good. They should be open to constructive criticism, at which point, of course, the Board of Deputies, the Jewish labor movement, Mike Katz, these people are sort of crazed. You know, they get upset. They say, how dare you criticize our training? And we're almost at the point where they are so outlandish and so beyond the realm of even reason or logic or normality, you know, they're sort of itching to say that, well, if you criticize our training, that, mean, that means you're problematic, you're racist, because you've criticized our training. There is a clear, unhinged, id poll underpinning to all of this. And it's not coming from the left. It's not coming from some undergraduate students. It's not some you know, sociology reading group from Goldsmith saying, if you don't agree with us, you're a racist, you're cancelled, you, you don't deserve a public platform. No, it's several quite significant civil society organizations in the UK who right now are leading the disciplinary processes of the Labour Party. It's remarkable. And ultimately, when you are this ridiculous and this at odds with reality and you find yourself seemingly now trying to cancel Martin Ford, a QC, yeah, you politically run out of road. And I think ultimately people start looking at you who maybe were allies or sympathetic and think, this is a little bit strange. I'm not going to carry on with the charade anymore. I'm certainly not going to potentially sink any political capital into people this odd, which is, which is how they look. So immensely grateful for the Ford report. And I think it is extraordinary that these revelations never would have come to light. They never would have come to light without independent media, particularly Navarra media. Other, other outlets too would have covered it if we hadn't. I do think that's extraordinary, Michael. You know, how many other stories in the last 20, 30, 40 years of this magnitude, these kinds of revelations, have simply not seen the light of day uh, because legacy media didn't want to cover them? which is why I'm so grateful to all our supporters. You, you've allowed us to break this massive story, which gave us the Ford report yesterday and confirmed so much of what we already knew, but now it's in black and white and it's rubber stamped with a QC's name. So thank you. He doesn't say explicitly, but I think an, uh, another group of people, the Ford report vindicates, is the people who leaked the original Labour leaks report. Because I mean, yeah. it, it's very clear in this, that he thinks a lot of the allegations are important and a lot of the evidence used is you know, in the public interest, right? So I know there were criticisms, you know, the, the name should have been redacted or some of the names should have been redacted or whatever. But I'm very, very grateful for whoever it was that leaked that report, because I think our understanding of British democracy is much stronger for it. I find it weird that sort of most of political journalism sees it as some kind of taboo to leak a report such as this. We're journalists. We're supposed to like it when things are leaked, which shine a light on stuff which would otherwise go unnoticed yet because it's damaging to the Labour right, because it's on this touchy issue of anti-Semitism, suddenly no one wanted to report on this thing. They're like, oh, it shouldn't have been leaked in the first place. You're supposed to be journalists. What's going on? It didn't just commend the leaker. It also said the people compiling the report were impartial, they weren't sectarian, and they were often critical of Jeremy Corbyn, and they were diligent, and these were honest people. You know, And if you'd listen to mainstream media coverage of this, the people compiling the report were nasty, awful, barbaric, disgusting, reprehensible. Actually, again, the QC examining all of this evidence in the light of day said something completely different, which tells you something quite important, I think, about how, how little you should take seriously the diktats of the, of the, the London Big House pundits and, and legacy media. Yeah.